So I had my show uh, cancelled uh, at Goldsmiths University um, uh, because I'm the wrong kind of feminist. Um, and, uh, and I, well, it was also cancelled because some people said that there might be a picket. Uh, so I was kind of disappointed that there wasn't a picket here. I was kind of like, come on, uh, let's, get, let's get involved. Um, and, and, but they started to, they, they said, they said I, I might contravene uh, the university's safe space policy. And, and I said, I don't understand. I don't understand what can possibly be the issue. And they said, well, our, union, our, our student union supports the sex industry. And, and I said, what is your student union's view on the oil and gas industry? <laughs> uh, or auto parts or any other industry? Surely you can have a view on people, but you can't have a view on an industry. And then they said, well, actually, there were some complaints made about you. And I said, great, well, send me the complaints and we'll talk about them. And uh, when the co complaints were shown to me, they didn't mention the sex industry in the slightest. They used a word that will be familiar to many people in this room, Islamophobia. <laughs> surprise, surprise. And apparently, uh, making a statement that opposes the idea of compulsory veiling is deeply offensive to the world's scarves and... Um, <laughs> cannot be tolerated in a 21st century community. And what is the, well, there are two really beautiful things about it. And the first one is this, is that the show I was, I was coming to do isn't anything about scarves, and it isn't anything um, about prostitution or the sex industry. Um, the show I was going to do um, is about free speech. <laughs> Which is pretty interesting. And what is even more amazing and really th thrills me uh, is that the reason that there was supposed to be a picket was because some students from LSE, from LSE suggested that they might come to the show and picket. They might come down to Goldsmiths and picket the show. And what is particularly brilliant um, is that Chris Moos and the guys who run the LSE uh, Atheist, Secularist and Humanist Association already put the show on at LSE. <laughs> We did it for their Christmas party. We did the extended version with games afterwards and it was packed out. So they've utterly, utterly missed the boat <laughs> at cancelling my show. But it's really interesting because whenever we start arguing about the sex industry and how best to solve the, the problems of abuse that inevitably seem to arise within it, um, uh, it, it's interesting because we end up with, with this idea um, that, well, we have to be uh, sex positive. And anybody who challenges sexual abuse is told, well, you're not sex positive. Um, and, and, and so there's this idea that you've either got to support all sex or none of it. There's that sex is all the same. And do you want sex or not sex? And those are the only options. Like, I don't quite understand what ever happened to supporting good sex and not shit sex. Um, but it's lovely because I was on the big questions in the middle of January and we had a debate about whether or not uh, England should introduce humanist weddings in the way that Scotland has already done. And uh, Andrew Copson from the, the BHA was there and uh, he said something very sweet and touching about humanism and finding reason in life without looking to higher beings. It was all very uh, poetic. And this lovely guy who was from an organisation called Discuss Jesus. Um, but he didn't actually want to discuss Jesus. <laughs> He angrily leapt to his feet and said, humanism is a first-class ticket to sexual debauchery. <laughs> Which is beautiful, isn't it? Because if you are going to sexual debauchery, debauchery, do not travel economy. <laughs> Don't take Ryanair to sexual debauchery. Arrive in style, for goodness sake. Um, it's just totally ridiculous. Um, but I do support good sex and great sex and brilliant sex. And um, so much so that I've been involved for a few years now with uh, shows which we've put on at the Bloomsbury Theatre under the name Sex Appeal. Um, and they're fundraisers, some of you may have been, they're fundraisers for Brooke, which is a charity uh, that provides sexual advice to young people. Um, it's sort of people ring up and go, I've sat on a toilet seat, will I be all right? Um, <laughs> that sort of thing. And so we do a fundraiser for them every year. And I love doing it. Uh, partly because it's a wonderful cause. But when you're a performer and you do uh, benefits for causes, they, they always give you a little freebie. Like, I don't want to... You don't want to make it sound like I'm, that's why I'm doing it. But they usually give you a bottle of wine or a box of chocolates or something. But the sex appeal gigs, because of their subject matter, they're sponsored by Love Honey. Um, and you see, I like the giggles of recognition and telling me a little bit about my audience. Um, they're an online sex toy retailer. And, and you might know them because you might have seen their late-night... Adverts. They have adverts on the TV which are absolutely brilliant. 
um, the highlight being there's a bit with a middle-aged couple sat there and they go, the packaging was incredibly discreet. We were worried the neighbours would find out, but <laughs> like, you're on ITV. <laughs> the neighbours know about your butt plugs now. You don't need to, yeah. I do like to mention Love Honey, because uh, this is the point, is that they give all the performers a little goodie bag. The goodie bags, they're not wine and they're not chocolates. They're so sex toys donated by Love Honey. And I, and I keep saying the word Love Honey, but I feel it's, it's only fair for me to give them a plug. <laughs> this is the fourth year I've done it, and every year the toys that they give you are a little bit different. They try to not give you the same thing every year, because they know some of us support the, 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 the benefit every year. And I didn't even open it, I just put it in my bag on the bus home. I thought that would be a sensible time to open it. <laughs> This year there was something in there, I always look through, oh, this looks good, I'll keep this, this one I'm not so sure about. This year, uh, for the first time, there was in the pack a pair of edible pants. Uh, edible pants, and, uh, and we've had lunch, so it's all right, you needn't worry, uh, meals are over. Uh, absolutely amazing, I, I can't say I've ever sort of thought about buying, it's not really my bag, but okay, great, a pair of edible pants. Now, because they are edible, on the back of the box, is nutritional information. <laughs> and it tells you how many calories there are in 100 grams of, in of edible pants. <laughs> and then it tells you how many calories there are in a serving. <laughs> Which begs some important questions uh, about the size of a serving of edible pants. Uh, now, this, this box contained one pair of edible pants, so you can imagine my surprise when next to the amount per serving, it said, servings per pack, 14.5. <laughs> so one pair of edible pants is supposed to provide 14 and a half servings. I mean, even if you use them every day, after a fortnight, are you still willing to put them in the fridge? <laughs> Get them out again? I can only assume uh, they're suitable for the sort of orgy at which at least 14 people, um, perhaps plus a bisexual, are enthusiastically uh, uh, gnawing on your pants at the same time. It doesn't seem feasible <laughs> to me, but I look forward to cartoons uh, probably to be published in Charlie Hebdo depicting how this works uh, or how it doesn't work. Um, good luck with that. Um, yeah, so, uh, which, is, which is what I kind of wrote down to say, but it is, it's been a really, really the weirdest of all possible weeks um, to be trying to talk about free speech, especially given that Goldsmiths did put on, um, you know, what I would consider to be an extremist Islamic speaker not that long ago, and suddenly they can't face a little bit of discussion uh, from the wrong kind um, of feminist. I know, and I think it's a real shame because I think that that on, on the left, as it were, or on, on the sort of, uh, you know, side of, the, of politics that is for social justice and everybody having a better life, I think we get caught up sometimes in, in this sort of, like, worrying about tiny details and infighting in a way. You know, like, I never hear David Cameron and Nigel Farage going, no, I think you're dehumanising immigrants the wrong way round. It's like they, they just get on with it. And because they're all working on it the same way, it doesn't seem to be such a problem. And... Um, and and, and when you're a feminist, actually, you don't really need infighting with other feminists because we get enough shit, thank you very much, from the world at large. I don't really need any more. And whenever you say you're a feminist, people always go, oh, I'm, you know, I'm all for equality. But I'm, I'm not really comfortable with that word. <laughs> and I'm sort of, that's what the word means, isn't it? That is what the word means. Um, it's a little bit like saying I really like hardened milk, but could you not say cheese? So let me be clear, I, under, I understand, right, that sometimes words, they get distorted in the media and, um, and, and, and it's not clear, there are different sorts of feminists, aren't there, so let me be clear, um, I understand some people aren't comfortable with the word feminist, I'm, I'm going to drop, stop using it, some people aren't comfortable with it, and anyway, I want to be more clear and more specific about where I fit into that whole puzzle, uh, so I actually much prefer to use the term radical cunt-wielding patriarchy smasher. <laughs> so... Uh, I hope that's clear. Thank you very much for having me. Have a brilliant uh, rest of your conference.